Καλησπέρα σας. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που εξηγήσαμε το Φεσέρ, που το βέβαια πασέ εν φρανσέ, και τι αναμένω. Καλησπέρα. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την παρουσία σας. Χαιρόμαστε πολύ που είστε τόσο πολλές και πολύ να παρακολουθήσετε τη διάλεξη του καθηγητή Ρος, που είναι κορυφαίος αναλυτής των διεθνών σχέσεων σε ένα πολύ γνωστό γαλλικό πανεπιστήμιο, το Paris Assas. Ε, ελπίζω ότι θα έχουμε την ευκαιρία μετά τη διάλεξή του να απαντήσει και σε κάποια ερωτήσει που θα έχει. Alors, je vais vous saluer en français. Et je suis vraiment très heureuse de, de vous accueillir dans cet institut de relations internationales d'Athènes, de Grèce. C'est notre plaisir de vous avoir. Et on salue les, la volonté de coopération avec l'Université Paris 2. Euh, spécialement, moi, que je suis alumni de cette université. Euh, donc, je suis vraiment très, très contente que notre saison commence avec vous. Euh, Συγχωρήστε με για τα, για τα γαλλικά, αλλά πιστεύω ότι είναι μια γλώσσα που πρέπει να ακούγεται euh, σε διεθνεί ανταλλαγέ, διότι τα αγγλικά μονοπολούν τη euh, γλώσσα αυτή. Απλώ χαιρέτησα τον καθηγητή στα γαλλικά, καθώ προέρχομαι και εγώ από το πανεπιστήμιο στο οποίο διδάσκει. Euh, je suis contente que ma chère collègue et amie, Marilena Topa, euh, a eu cette initiative euh, de, de vous inviter. Je suis aussi très contente qu'on a euh, une collègue grecque en venant de, de Paris 2, Madame Aloupis. Et on a aussi notre, notre board de, de l'Institut des Relations Internationales. C'est vraiment très, très, très très bien de vous avoir ici et d'essayer de, 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 de déchiffrer, disons, ce qui, qui se passe dans l'environnement international qui est vraiment en mutation radicale. Absolument. Et je passe euh, le <rire> <les> flor. <rire> Tu Marilena, eh, encore eh, soyez les bienvenus, monsieur le professeur. Merci. Kalispera Pomena, I'll turn to English. Uh, the visit of Professor Orff here is uh, because of the um, cooperation of our Pandion University in the Erasmus. Uh, project with uh, Paris Sorbonne. And it's an extremely interesting moment to have this cooperation for a student. So uh, those of you that want to start in France uh, for Erasmus, for uh, the months uh, provided by the Erasmus project, now have a new opportunity to do it in uh, La Sorbonne. Uh, I want to also to add that, uh, if I'm correct, there are also English uh, speaking yeah, uh, courses. Pro, uh, courses that are provided. So even those of you that are not very fluent in French and uh, are interested in studying for some months in Paris, uh, have the possibility to do it. So because of this visit to for uh, the cooperation agreement between the two universities. Uh, we took the initiative to invite him for this uh, very interesting lecture. Uh, the subject I think is really uh, extremely interesting in our institute. Uh, professor uh, Roche is a professor of uh, international relations in his university. He began his career as a professional officer at the United Nations before being appointed as a tenure professor in political science in France. And he, currently he is a uh, professor at Paris University, where he's in charge of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Armament and Defense. He's more particularly specialized in security and defense studies where his researchers focus on the theoretical dimension of global security and issues dealing with privatized security. 
French reading students are invited to read his classic book, Theory, Theory des Relations Internationales. Now this book, the small book, which has inside all the theories of international relation is uh, at its ninth edition and still going as I imagine. And it's a must for all students in France that study international relations. So with no further ado, I give you the floor. Thank you, Marinesa. Uh, thank you for Pantheon University for this kind invitation. Professor Alupi and I are very happy to, to be here. And we really uh, have the desire to strengthen uh, the old partnership, uh, because uh, this partnership was signed maybe 10 years ago with Professor Irina Shiri. And uh, today we are here to strengthen it. And uh, I hope that the next year we'll have uh, students from Pontellon University here. And I hope that uh, some French uh, students will come here at uh, in your university. So thank you very much for this invitation. And uh, I will begin this uh, lecture. I would like to say that, first of all, I, I'm not sure of what I will say, because the transformation of war, it's an old, old title. Uh, I suppose that you know from Martin von Krevel's uh, famous book, but uh, I would like to, present another kind of war Van Krevel never, you know, didn't see. That is to say, a world where war is maybe something from the past. Maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, I have been living in a world where war was no longer a political tool. For more than 30 years, uh, we saw that war was no longer possible. But today, with what is happening in Ukraine, uh, maybe I'm I too old. Maybe uh, am I an old man dreaming of an old world where peace was uh, the main uh, state of the world. But uh, maybe that uh, things are changing. I hope no. But what I'll describe is the world in which we are living today. I don't know what will happen tomorrow. I hope that uh, the trend we are, the, the, the present tra uh, trend will go on, but I'm not sure of it. And I'll let you decide. And I'll let you act and behave in order to uh, strengthen this long peace we have known uh, since uh, the end of the Cold War. So again, as a faithful reader of uh, Steven Pinker, uh, I would say against common sense that uh, our world is getting better, much better even. Uh, in 200 years, extreme poverty in the world has gone from 90% to 10%. Per person. It has been even divided by four since 1990. And you have here a curve and you see obviously the trend divided by four in 30 years. An African born today can expect to live as long as an American born in the 50s, in 1950. And when we compare uh, literate population in the 17th century and today in the 17th century, just 7% of uh, the world population was able to read. And today it's more than 80%. And uh, in another uh, figure, and I take all these examples from Steven Pinker's book, uh, in 1974, more than 34% of the world population was uh, suffering from uh, hunger or were starving. Today, only 13% of the world population. Uh, of course, uh, the figures are almost the same, around 1,000, the, the bottom billion 
one uh, one uh, billion people are starving. But uh, what we must see is that uh, in the 70s, the world population was around uh, 3.4 uh, billion of inhabitants, and today it's almost uh, 8 billion. So uh, our world is better than uh, the world we have known in the past. And it's the same thing when we deal with violence, and it is, of course, subject of uh, this lecture. In, in the 50s, the risk of dying due to organized political violence, and I will explain you what we mean with organized political uh, violence, was 21 times higher than today. That is to say, according to the Uppsala Conflict Data Program, maybe have you heard of this uh, famous uh, program, and the figure of the Codex of War in the United States, States are almost the same. Uh, la last year, uh, 100, uh, 120,000 people died in uh, organized political violence. 120,000 for a population of 8 billion inhabitants. I, I won't say it's nothing, of course. Uh, each day, more than uh, 300 people die in that kind in this kind of violence but if we compare uh, people dying from malaria it's 1800 that is to say mosquitoes are more dangerous than bullets and uh, uh, 25000 people die every day from hunger it's higher than people dying from political violence so uh, I think that we are living in a safe world. Oh, of course, you will tell me that uh, there is Ukraine, of course. But just compare some pictures. Here, you have a famous picture from uh, the beginning of uh, the Second World War in, in France. Here, you have a picture in last August in Crimea. And you have tourists bathing uh, in front of uh, an helicopter. And you, you, maybe you have seen uh, this other picture, tourists bathing in front of uh, a Russian base, which has been attacked. And beside you have a picture of uh, uh, the Nankin slaughter in 1937. So there is nothing to be compared. When we look at the, at the figure, um, we during the at the beginning of the war of a war generally uh, it's the period of time where uh, the combat the the fights are uh, the the more fierce and uh, during the first world war a third of the French soldiers who died during this war were killed during the first six months that is to say almost. Uh, 500,000 people, soldiers, died in six months, just in France. During the Verdun battle at the end of uh, 1916, uh, it was a nine-month battle, and more than 160,000 French soldiers died during this battle. And uh, in front of the French soldiers, 140,000 German soldiers were killed in this battle. Four months after this uh, battle in Verdun, during the Somme battle, more than 200,000 French soldiers and 200,000 German soldiers were killed. So when uh, we look at the figure given by the Ukrainian uh, authorities, 9,000, uh, 9, according to open source, it might be uh, 35,000. Uh, but even if it is 35,000 in six months, uh, it is nothing to be compared with the former war we, we have known in, in, the past, in the past. And uh, in fact, you, we are focused, of course, on, on Ukraine, because Ukraine is uh, part of Europe. Uh, but uh, we must consider that uh, in uh, Yugoslavia, it was more than 200,000 uh, deaths. In uh, Chechen, uh, during the two wars, there were more than 300,000 deaths and, and so on. So even 
if there are these, uh, if we know that these wars are cruel and that there are a lot of ca many casualties, there is a global trend, and this trend is uh, going, in fact, is announcing a, a better world. And in the case of Ukraine, in fact, it reveals that uh, for all, at least for democracy, at least for democracy, war is no longer a political tool. And it's obvious uh, when we compare the military budget of Russia and the military budget of uh, the European NATO countries, we see that in Russia, the mili military budget was around 66 billion dollars. And the military budget of European uh, NATO countries is 200. 84 billion dollars. Really, there is such a gap between uh, the Russian budget and the European budget. Even, and I don't speak about bribery, corruption, and so on. We are not sure that the 66 billions of uh, uh, 66 billion dollars were spent for military purposes. But even if these uh, 66 billion were spent for military purposes, uh, Russia was not afraid of NATO country. Otherwise, uh, Russia would have never attacked uh, if uh, they consider that NATO was a threat. And uh, even the miscalculation con uh, considering or concerning the unity of NATO countries reveals the fact that Russia was counting on the passivity of European countries. And in fact, we know that the Putin despises uh, our Western uh, countries, our Western regime. And one of uh, his reasons is that uh, he considers that uh, we, are now, we are cohort countries and uh, we are seeking for peace dividend instead of uh, uh, being courageous. So he, he decided to launch this war because he was sure that the European country would not react. So it's a proof that at least for all countries, war is no longer a tool, a political uh, tool. And we see uh, this global evolution through a few uh, if you see, uh, look here, it's a uh, glo global death in conflict since the 15th century. And you see uh, the trend is obvious. It's more obvious when we look at the period from uh, 1945 to today. And you see the peak in the 50s and today where we are. So uh, war is no longer uh, violent, it's still violent, of course, for people who are suffering, who are killed during this war, but this war are less, um, there are less casualties during modern war than, uh, than before. And uh, of course, will tell me uh, after Ukraine and terrorism, but terrorism, in fact, uh, you have uh, the figure here in 2019, uh, less than uh, 14, uh, thousand people were killed uh, in terrorist attack, but 70% uh, uh, of uh, these casualties were uh, concentrated in five countries only. It means that there are less than 5,000 people who were killed in terrorist attack uh, all over the world. And what does it mean? It means that, uh, and I calculated, you, you laughed, you are 400 times more chance of winning the Euro million jackpot than to be killed in a terrorist attack. So I suppose you don't uh, play at the Euro million because you are quite sure you'll never get the jackpot. So I think that you don't have to be afraid of terrorist attack, even if we cannot get rid of terrorism, even if terrorism is something which uh, and jeopardize uh, the security of a country. Of course, we have to deal with it, but we have not, uh, we don't have to uh, consider that it is a major threat. It is a threat, but uh, it's not a ma major threat. And 
finally, we can see that uh, since I have to deal at the same time with uh, uh, international relations theory, international uh, relations theorists, theoricians, uh, had presumed this trend, this evolution, but no one dared to formalize the idea that we are living in a world where war is possible uh, over. Uh, in 1962, in War and Peace Among Nations, Raymond Aron spoke or, or described the possibility of a trend to decrease the forced employed, a possibility only, and a trend to decrease the forced uh, employed. So he had the intuition that war were less fierce, less violent than in the past, but uh, it was all. In 1977, I think that international relations student, uh, student in international relations know uh, Ed Lebul. Ed Lebul wrote about an anarchical society. What does it mean? It means that, uh, of course, there is always a risk of war, but uh, uh, he condemned the idea of an international arena where uh, states would fight each other uh, like option gladiator. So, uh, of course, there is anarchy, but at the same time, we have social uh, relations, uh, social relations had been established be between states. So, anarchy and society at the same time. A few years after, uh, Barry Buzan in People, States and Fear uh, described the security complex between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. That is to say, uh, war was not possible due to the, the atomic uh, bombs. Uh, and we see that uh, with the peripheral conflict at that time, it was not possible to launch a war in the, in, in the central strategic uh, area and war were uh, expelled towards the periphery of uh, the core uh, system. And uh, this security complex described by uh, Barry Buzan uh, was at the origin of, of a concept I use very often, the idea of a possible maturation of international anarchy. So uh, I use it very often, uh, a mature anarchy uh, like that, uh, I had said everything with no risk at all. I, I, I did not say that the war was at, uh, was at an end, uh, but I, I say that uh, international relations were not black and white. It was a, a different uh, color, but in the gray shades uh, and so on. So uh, I use uh, this word maturation of international anarchy, but I daren't go uh, and I daren't say that we're, we're living in a world where, uh, war, where uh, war was no longer possible. Uh, there is another uh, author, but he's not an international, uh, he, he's not uh, in politics, but he's an historian. It's John Lewis Gaddis who released in 1984, if my memory serves me right, uh, the long piece describing the relation between the USSR and the United States. But in fact, uh, the big shift occurred in 2010, when Jess Richard uh, clearly expressed uh, the unbelievable idea that uh, we were living in a possible world where uh, we were where we were assisting at the end of war. The end of war is, is uh, the title of another book uh, released two years after by John Organ, The End of War. And in fact, since uh, 2010, there have been many books dealing with this unbelievable idea of a secret peace of uh, the end of war. Uh, there is a famous uh, paper and you can find it on the uh, internet uh, on uh, the Journal of Peace Research of Azargat, Is War Declining and Why? We have a paper 
uh, you have here the biography, uh, bi bibliography. You have uh, Charles Philip David for people who are able to, to read in French. Uh, Charles Philip David wrote a famous paper uh, whose title was uh, Is War Becoming Something from the Past? So it's a new editorial trend. And uh, Stephen Pinker, who is the better angel of nature, uh, describe it with many, many, many figures, describe a world where war, war is no longer uh, the main activity of man. But uh, of course, I have to describe very quickly uh, these different uh, figures. I have to give you my sources. And after that, we'll see why it is so difficult to believe that we are living in a better world. But as I told you at the very beginning, maybe am I a man from the past, and maybe of future, your future will be different. But today, I think that this figure are still accurate and give us another perspective than the one you can have when you open your television or when you are uh, surfing on, on the web. So first of all, we will uh, see uh, the figure which confirms that uh, there is an illusion of disorder. And all, since 1962, we know that uh, we study war through data. Since uh, Singer created uh, the College of War in uh, Harvard, since uh, the creation of the Uppsala Conflict Data Program or uh, the Human Security Report, all these data have almost the same figure. That is to say, more or less 100,000 casualties a year. More or less 100,000 ca casualties. Here I'll, uh, oh, sorry. So here you have, uh, but I'll let you the, yeah, yeah. the PowerPoint so you'll be able to. So uh, here I, I'll use the Upsa Conflict Data Program because every year maybe some of you uh, read uh, the Journal of Peace Research. And each year in July, there is a, a, a paper, a recurrent paper with the same title, Organized Violence, 1945 to 2021. And in this paper, uh, the author, uh, Generally, it's uh, Ellen Peterson and, and Ali uh, describe the last uh, result of the Uppsala conflict da data program. And here you have the number of uh, conflicts. That is to say, here in uh, red, it is conflict, state conflict. That is to say, interstate conflict, internal conflict, which are internationalized, or internal conflict with one state one state at least, which are not international. That is to say, less than 60. If we look at the number of deaths, here yeah, you have it very accurate, as I told you. You have 120, 648 casualties. In the state-based violence, that is to say, as I told you, conflict, Interstate conflict or conflict at least with one state, uh, internal uh, conflict, you have uh, 84,000 uh, deaths. In uh, non state violence, that is to say, uh, factional struggle, very often in collapsed states, you have uh, 25,000 uh, casualties. And uh, since a few years, they add uh, the one side violence, that is to say, Larger scale mafia violence uh, in in uh, in Mexico, for for example, and there you have around 10,000 uh, 10, uh, deaths. You have here uh, a figure, and it is very interesting because we see year after year the evolution of conflictuality. It's true today the train. Is, uh, we have a reverse trend and uh, an increasing of uh, casualties, but we are around 100,000 uh, casualties. So uh, when we look more precisely uh, the details of uh, these casualties, 
we have, uh, as I told you, uh, 45 armed conflict, uh, state, uh, state conflict, uh, just two interstate armed conflict in 2021. That is to say, Iran, Israel, and Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. Uh, we had uh, 25 uh, internal conflict, internationalized internal conflict, and uh, 27 internal conflict which are not internationalized. But here, there is a big change. Traditionally, internal conflict which were internationalized were more violent. And today, it's the opposite. International conflict which are not internationalized are more violent than uh, the other. But more interesting, uh, you know, we have to decide when we are at war because uh, uh, Nikki uh, can say that, uh, since she is a lawyer, because the law will be totally different when we are at war. And the difference between a conflict and a war, well, we need to have a threshold. We need to have a, 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 a threshold, and this, uh, this threshold is one thousand battlefield related death. And we have just among these 45, 44 armed uh, conflict, we have just four, uh, five conflict, uh, we, which reach, uh, which reach uh, the intensity of war. In uh, 1991, 13 conflict, and today just five conflict. So quickly, non-state conflict, uh, so fractional uh, violence, we have uh, 66, uh, 76 uh, conflict with 25,000 victims, and 40 actors were involved in one side violence, as I told you, the gangs in, uh, in Mexico. And if we compare uh, with uh, uh, the 80s, uh, if we compare with uh, the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, and here I use the figure of the Human Security Report and which are uh, used by Charles Philippe David at the same time, we consider that there is a reduction of victim linked to civil war of 25%. A reduction and it's a good thing of victims linked to genocide, 90%. Uh, we have a 70% uh, of uh, secessionist conflict uh, are resolved, and wars today are shorter than uh, before because during the 70s, uh, half of all wars lasted more than five years, and today, one fifth of uh, the war lasted more than five years. So uh, the, the facts are obvious, but I'm sure I did not convince you. I'm sure that you don't believe this, but it's not statistics, it's data. So it's real world, but I'm not able to convince you. So now in the second part of this lecture, I'll try to convince you uh, and uh, to have another view on our world. So the first explanation why does the subjective feeling of insecurity prevail over the objective, I won't say scientific, but the objective observation of reality, uh, there is one element of response that uh, we can take from Tocqueville. Tocqueville was dealing with inequality. But in fact, uh, there is what we call the Tocqueville paradox. And Tocqueville said about inequality, but we can say exactly the same thing with violence. The more an unpleasant phenomena is reduced, the more what remains of it is perceived or experienced as unbearable. So violence was central in, uh, in our life since uh, uh, the Neanderthal ne uh, manner of Neanderthal. Violence was central, and nowadays it's less central. Um, we have figured during uh, the Paleolithic, 25% of, um, of young men were killed before uh, they were adults. 25%. Uh, so violence was central, 
And today it is no longer central, but what remains is absolutely unbearable. Here it's the, the Tocqueville paradox. We have another uh, response, uh, which is given by Timur Kuran with a public, uh, public light and private truth. He, he said that when your opinion is based on public opinion, a new fact, as the, the fact I presented to you, cannot change your own opinion. It's only if you are a specialist, it's only if you have a scientific approach of a subject that a new fact can change your opinion. And I'm sure that you didn't know this figure. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, you are not very numerous here to, to read every year the Journal of Peace Research. So the fact I presented to you cannot con convince you. So uh, I think that uh, uh, to change your opinion, to change your point of view, we have to proceed in uh, two time, in uh, with two uh, different periods. In the first period, we have to look after the tool. Uh, I would say, uh, comparing comparing with computer, we should look at the software uh, which allow access to or to to the world, to the news. And then we'll have to look at the operating system, that is to say the theories that allow us to use this program. I used to compare uh, the situation with uh, an old uh, Windows, uh, uh, Windows 7. Uh, if you have a brand new program, I will say uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking, I don't know if you use it, but uh, it's a superb program. But if you use the last version of Dragon Naturally Speaking with an old Windows uh, 7, it won't work well. You have to change the, uh, the old version of Dragon Naturally Speaking to buy the, uh, the last one, but you have to change at the same time the, uh, the, the operating system. And it's uh, interesting because we have three major operating systems, Windows, iOS, and Linux. And uh, we can say, we can compare Windows with the realist approach, uh, iOS with uh, the liberal approach, and Linux with uh, the critical approach. And so we'll see, first of all, uh, the pernicious software. And I, I think that uh, uh, there are four bias which uh, prevent us from taking the measure of the evolution, sorry, of uh, the evolution in progress. The first bias is what Steven Pinker uh, calls the, negativ the negativity bias. Of course, uh, you are not interested in the 10,000 plane uh, which, land, which land every day uh, on time. But when there is a crash, of course, uh, you are more interesting. And there is a very interesting African proverb which say the tree that falls make more noise than the forest that grows. I think it's a, a good explanation of uh, the influence of the news on your opinion. And in fact, we see that uh, we use more and more uh, news items uh, for describing uh, uh, our world. In France, uh, French INA, the French uh, uh, official uh, research center dealing with uh, information and communication, uh, according to this uh, establishment, uh, according to the French INA, uh, in 10 years, news items have increased by 73%. That is to say, at the main uh, journal at 8 p.m., uh, in 2002, we use uh, and we were presented around uh, around 1,200 news items, and now it's almost 2,100. So we we are building here what uh, semiologists call an hyper reality. Hyper reality, and I like uh, Umberto's echo definition of this hyper reality. That is to say, the false world, the false reality. 
We think that uh, because we read the paper, we look at television, we are informed, but we are informed with uh, uh, specific uh, cases which do not explain the whole situation. So this is hyperreality. Going on with uh, uh, the prism, uh, the bias of uh, information, of the negativity uh, bias, there is a prism of emotion. And as used to say, but it's a long time ago, Cyrus Vance, who was a former state, um, in charge of the State Department, he used to say, we have today a diplomacy which are hostage to the emotion of the moment. And of course, you, you recognize here this very famous uh, picture. You see young Kim Fuck running uh, after uh, a napalm uh, attack. And you have, you know it unfortunately in Greece, uh, uh, this uh, young uh, uh, Eilan on the beach. And uh, you knew the consequences of the Eilan's death. So no, no need to describe it. And uh, a French writer, Zaki Laidi, who is one of my colleagues from Sciences Po, wrote, emergency mobilize a decisive resource, that is to say emotion. However, but its very nature, emotion has immeasurable temporal consequences. It disqualify in advance any challenge to this immediacy. That is to say, there is no place for a reason when emotion is overwhelming. So this is a second BS of uh, reading too many papers, newspapers. The third BS is a prism of specialism. Of specialism. In fact, uh, I'm very happy when there is a war. You are very happy when there is a war, just because usually we are just facing our students who are obliged to listen to us. But all of a sudden, we have a phone call from uh, various uh, television networks and uh, they ask us uh, uh, if we are available for, uh, for going on for, for rendezvous. And of course, I do that just for my mother. My mother is so proud to see uh, her son on television. And... Uh, when a specialist is invited, he won't say that, in fact, the problem is not so dramatic. In fact, he has to insist on the importance of his research. He cannot say it's not uh, dramatic because he would say, uh, by the, in the same way, that what he does is not so important. So uh, since uh, the real-time information area in which we are living in needs to have many specialists, you have uh, so many observations where, which are all going in the same way, that is to say, we are living in a dramatic world. And it's not true. And finally, the fourth uh, prism is the prism of global security. You know, uh, since uh, the middle of the, since the Barry Buzan, Richard Ullman, we speak of global security. We cannot uh, consider security just from a military uh, point of view. We have at the same time to take into consideration the economical, uh, the financial, the human rights, the values, uh, the sanitary uh, dimension of security and the environmental dimension of security. And now, Look here and let's implement a simple uh, experience together. Uh, you see here it was the shield uh, during uh, the, the Cold War, a single uh, a shield made of uh, solid, of strong uh, iron wire, but uh, it was just in order to protect us against at an atomic attack. But we add, after that, a second layer of uh, iron wire to protect us against economical threats. Then a third uh, layer to protect us against uh, human rights, uh, attempt to human rights or to our core values. Then a fourth uh, or fifth layer uh, for protecting us from sanitary uh, threat and the last layer uh, to protect us from environmental layers. So you have here uh, 
the first uh, shield during the Cold War, and at the end you have uh, the last uh, shield. Now, and this is the beginning of the experiment, you put this shield, imagine, you put this shield under a tap and you open the water. So, first question, when do you feel secure about the water you drink? It's obvious, with the first shield, with the first drainer, because the clear, the water is totally clear and you drink it uh, without any question. Ah. And the opposite, when you see uh, how polluted is the water with a six layer, you think you cannot drink it, it's too dangerous. So you feel more sick, you feel more secure with the first layer. So it's a feeling. But now, when are you rationally more secure? With the first layer or with the last layer? Yeah. Last layer, because you see how polluted is the water and you know that we'll try to improve the quality of better. So, and uh, there is a psychological uh, effect when we deal with security issues. It is the Copenhagen uh, School which said with Ole Weaver and once more with Barry Buzan, we need to desecurize uh, some issues because each time we consider that an issue is a security issue, there is, uh, it's one uh, it's the French admiral who said, uh, and I like this formula, there is uh, an anxiety inducing perversion of strategic discourse. Each time, we speak of security, we feel insecure. And the example is with migration. If we consider it as a security issue, we feel insecure. If we consider it as a humanitarian issue, we feel less insecure. So there are four uh, bias, four prisms, which uh, uh, transform your uh, point of view over the world. But now let's look at uh, the operating system. Let's look at the theories. And we'll see that uh, uh, all the theories are obsolete. First of all, let's look at the uh, Windows operating system as a realist uh, approach. And I am a realist. But uh, uh, at the very beginning of realism, we consider that, uh, you, you know, can it worse, man, the state and, and war. We consider that the uh, uh, origin of, of war had to be found in the international structure because these structures were based on power. You know, uh, according to Morgan Tau, uh, the core of international relations is interest defined as power. But the problem is that uh, with power is that it, it is a zero-sum game. That is to say, what I gain is why you lose, is what you lose. So, uh, because this uh, natural instability, uh, international relations are always a challenge. But what we call the neoclassical realism, they consider after Kenneth Walsh, 1979, this time, we consider that uh, the, the angle stone, the cornerstone of international relations is no longer power, but security. And it, it's a main uh, transformation of international relations and of uh, the realist approach. But there is a huge difference because security is a common good. If I strengthen my security, I strengthen at the same time I enhance the security of my neighbor. But if my security is jeopardized, I'll jeopardize the security of my neighbor. So it's a common good. And since it is a common good, we can consider today with neoclassical realism that uh, our world, the structure of international relations are safer, are less unstable. But unfortunately, and I think that I'm responsible, um, I'm, I'm not the only responsible, but I think that the uh, theorization of international relations didn't do the job. We should have 
presented this new research. In fact, do you have, can you imagine to study biology with a book which would have been published in 1962? It's impossible. Uh, there, were, there have been so many progress in biology, but it's the same thing in international relations theory. But when we speak about realism in France, but I suppose that in Greece, it's exactly the same thing. We speak of a classical realism, uh, which considers that the characteristic of uh, international relation is the legality and the legitimacy of, of war. But it's no longer true with modern uh, realism, but modern uh, classical, neoclassical realism is not known at all. I, I don't know if you study, if you read the Stephen Ward, Charles Glazer, but uh, in fact, we should uh, use this author to publish paper, but in newspaper to give to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the lecture of this paper, a new vision of, uh, of uh, realism, but classical realism cannot explain this end of war. And unfortunately, when we speak of realism, we usually speak about classical realism. Now, if we look, if we look at liberalism, the IOS uh, program, in fact, uh, it's difficult to, for uh, the Kantian liberals to consider that state can be the best protection uh, of, uh, of humanity. Uh, it's very difficult for them to consider that, uh, uh, for quoting uh, Hobbes, for considering that state, the coldest of uh, cold monster, as said Nietzsche, can be the last, uh, the least bad bulwark against uh, insecurity. It's not possible for uh, this, uh, these liberals because they consider that uh, in each man we find humanity. And when one single man is killed, it's humanity which is uh, jeopardized. So uh, they cannot consider that we are living in a peaceful world. And at the same time, these liberals who are, in fact, the neoconservative, they're prone uh, intervention in order to protect a threatened po uh, population in emergency situation. But these interventions, maybe these interventions are uh, from the past. And I'm not sure that we'll have so many interventions in the future. But all the interventions we, uh, we have seen since uh, the end of the Cold War were against the principle of the United Nations, which consider that for developing peaceful and friendly uh, relations between states, we must avoid to have uh, value judgment. We must avoid to consider that we are, we are in a just world, uh, in a just war, considering that we have always God in our side. So uh, this intervention are again the principle of developing friendly and, um, and peaceful relationship. And for these uh, liberals, in fact, they, uh, what they are aiming at, in fact, is uh, to develop uh, intervention to promote intervention, which will create violence. So they cannot consider that uh, we get rid and we succeeded in getting rid of uh, violence. Finally, when we look at the Linux uh, operating systems, uh, that is to say uh, the critical of approach, there is a two different uh, perspectives. There is a post-Marxist perspective, that is to say, the Hegelian tradition. And for Hegel, war is a necessity. It's a necessity because if there is no war, the slaves won't be able to break their chains. And uh, if, uh, if we are living in a world with no war, it means that uh, the slaves uh, decided to keep their chains, and uh, it's impossible for them. 
And at the same time, with the critical approach or intersectionality, it depends on how you, you call it uh, today, there is the ecologic, uh, ecological dimension. And uh, for this ecological dimension, they need a cataclysmic event to change the mode of production. I said the former Minister of, uh, for Environment in France, uh, Yves Cochet, change will not come through the ballot box. Uh, a real human catastrophe will have to occur. There must be social disorder, not to say chaos or civil war, for an awakening, uh, an awakening to, to occur. So uh, Angela Merkel uh, needed uh, Fukushima to, to get rid of uh, the German nuclear plants. So they need catastrophe, they ask for chaos, for disorder, for civil war, for creating the condition of a new world. And if everything is perfect, if we are living in a safe world, in fact, there will be no transformation of this world. And for the, uh, the critical approach, it's not possible. So as a conclusion, I would say that the three theoretical mainstream are incapable of thinking of the end of war. For the classical realist, peace is just a period of time between two wars. For the liberals in the logic of human security, they believe that as long as one people is dying, the world cannot be at peace. And finally, for the critical approach, because they intend to deconstruct or current world in order to construct a better world. So as a conclusion, you see that I'm a neoclassical realist. I'm rather optimist. I'm not sure I succeeded in convincing you. I'm not sure that uh, the world in which you have had the luck to, to live uh, will go on. I'm not sure the long peace uh, will go on. I hope it will, but I think it will be your duty to, uh, to, do, uh, to manage the different tools that, uh, that have been created for creating this long piece. It will be your duty and no longer my duty. Thank you for your attention. Merci, merci, professor. Thank you. Uh, I, I admit that I become more optimistic now because, I mean, with the, with the war in Ukraine, I think we were all shocked. I mean, that war is coming back uh, in European theater at the heart of Europe. But, I mean, you have proven with your excellent presentation that, I mean, the statistics are not supporting this. It's not statistics, it's real data. It's real, it's data. It's real data. So this is, uh, so I think that we have uh, with us uh, quite a good number of uh, colleagues and also, of course, the, the young students that uh, have come, uh, so many, I mean, to, to listen to you and maybe they have questions to raise. So we will have 30 minutes of uh, exchange. May I ask? Yes, please. Who has been convinced? Well, no, it's a failure. <laughs> well, can, can, can I just ask you a very brief one? Thank you. Um, that was really you, you, you use the mic because, yes, yes, because it is recorded for oh, our website. So maybe I don't want to. Not for security <laughs> reasons, but for, yeah, for, okay, for, no. for transparency. Thanks, no. But like I said, I enjoyed it for the first part, the data of the objective part, as well as your. Um, Argumentation in the second part, but my, my question is a simple one, a very brief one. You mentioned thrice or maybe more evolution, right? And it was as if you almost threw at us this objective data to convince us that there was something that was more than you know a series of, of coincidences, and therefore there was evolution towards the end of the war. I'm putting this rather crudely, but after all, there was something there. If you use the word evolution again and again, obviously you mean something like 
So my question is this, do you mean it in earnest? Because if you, if you do mean it in earnest, then what's the mechanism? Evolution requires a mechanism. It could be a natural selection of norms, for example. As you know, that there are theorists that work on this, how norms mutate, and then how you have you know, a natural selection through mutation of new norms, and these new norms make it uh, less, make war less attractive. But, but what sort of mechanism are you thinking about? If, if you mean evolution in madness. In fact, in 1990, what a surprise. When you look at the movies of the 80s, I, I suppose that you know, uh, you have uh, seen Terminator, you have seen Mad Max, all these movies were about the, the world after Armageddon. Yeah. So we expected a huge, uh, a huge war, and this war did not occur. And it was a surprise, just because uh, all of a sudden, the different mechanism which has been created very often uh, in disorder, but all of a sudden, all this uh, instrument made sense. And in fact, I have, uh, uh, as you say, uh, I have a course in uh, international security, theory of international security. And uh, there are, uh, when I'm looking at the old world, and there are two parts, the old world and the new world, dealing with global security. But when I, I look at the old world, I try to understand this mechanism. And in fact, there are three mechanisms. First mechanism is peace, by force. And the first instrument uh, for creating peace is deterrence. Uh, that is to say, uh, uh, Pax Atomica. Which is uh, a traditional concept. A, yeah. Yes, but it's the first concept. The second concept is peace by law. And uh, by law, what I mean, I mean the international law uh, at, at the very beginning, that uh, then norms, a regime, then disarmament uh, negotiation, then uh, peaceful settlement of dispute, uh, the chapter six, then um, collective security, then uh, international sanctions, and there are uh, international punishment, individual and collective uh, punishment. So it's peace by law. And the third part is peace by negotiation. That is to say balance of power, that is to say the alliance, uh, Aaron described a world which was uh, a kind of jungle, but at the same time, we are living in peace with Germany after three major wars in less than one century. It means that the political negotiation can create the condition of peace. And when we are in an alliance, you know Karl Deutsch, when you uh, decided to create an alliance, it means that you decide to get rid of war or settle your dispute with the other member of the alliance. So there are alliances, there are confidence building measures, and you have pacific coexistence. Uh, when you consider that in 1953, uh, Molotov, uh, Malenkov uh, declared that uh, in the nuclear age, it's no longer possible to uh, uh, consider that war is a possibility. It means that uh, Pacific coexistence here is a reality. And finally, all these different tools uh, before we created many tools and it always failed. But all of a sudden, uh, it worked. And I think that your role, your duty will be to strengthen these different tools. That means to say, to strengthen uh, your defense capacities because defense is the best guarantee to avoid war. It means that you must accept to get rid of the peace dividend to invest more money for your defense. So here in Greece, it's not a problem because uh, you have the problem, uh, one-known problem with your neighbors. So your budget uh, is uh, the highest uh, European military budget. But uh, in France, is around uh, 2% of the uh, GDP, we have to, to accept to increase uh, our defense, to strengthen our uh, defense industry, to strengthen our alliance, that is to say NATO and the European Union. Then we have to strengthen the law instrument because this instrument has to be reinvented. 
permanent, has to be permanently reinvented. So you will have to reinvent uh, the instrument for uh, peaceful settlement of dispute. And uh, uh, the diplomatic uh, instrument, for example, balance of power, bal balance uh, is only the result of forces which are balanced if they are opposed. So if there is no opposition, you cannot have a balance, uh, an equilibrium. So you have to accept the idea to, uh, to, to increase the forces you deploy in international affairs just in order to be able to uh, balance, uh, to create the condition of a new balance of power with your neighbor. So this is, these are the different instruments which succeeded, but it was a kind of miracle. And we live, I live, I have, we have had the chance to live in this world. I hope that you will still have the chance to live with this, uh, with this world. And I have uh, the, the big course in, of, in first year at ASAS, in international relations with, uh, at the beginning of the year, to have the, uh, the textbook. So it, it, uh, all the students uh, do not attend the, the course, but the uh, first two or three uh, course I have in front of me, 1,600 one uh, students. And uh, during the first course, I, I have a PowerPoint with uh, Greta. And I say that I'm sure that many among you uh, consider that she is right and that your parents let you uh, an horrible world. And in fact, I would like to say that we leave you, all generation, leave you a better world uh, than uh, the one you think. Because anger, as I told you, health is better, uh, illness, uh, look at the, the COVID crisis. In two years, we have been able to create a vaccine. It's uh, extraordinary because violence decreased. So we let, you, we let you a better world than before. And your duty will be to uh, strengthen uh, this world. Let's open the floor now. Yes, uh, Professor Papasadriou, you have to speak at this mic. We don't have the... because we don't have the moving uh, the roving <laughs> microphone, and so and you have also to look at the camera because you know we are in a digital world. <laughs> I think it makes uh, sense to see that humanity is improved. Wars were constant in the Middle Ages. Now they are rare. Also, we've seen uh, after 1945, no longer wars of invasion and annexation. A few exceptions. It's in the Falklands, maybe Kuwait. So the Ukraine war really does seem to be a step back to an era of wars of conquest and annexation. We've had all sorts of wars, but not this kind of war after 1945. A few exceptions. That's why I think Ukraine is such a shock. It's but it's also in Europe. But before Ukraine, in Ossetia and Abkhazia, in Georgia, in 2008, Russia did the same thing. It's uh, It's not an ex but uh, it was almost the same. Uh, in uh, Crimea, it was an expression, and we did not react. And in fact, since we did not react, we and gave uh, uh, new ideas to Putin. And here we can see that when there is no balance of power, uh, there is no peace. So we should have react more rapidly to what was a, uh, really a, an attack against the whole world because the, the rule, as you say, is that uh, uh, annexion uh, is no longer possible. And according to the Helsinki process, uh, it was decided that uh, we transform intangibility of frontier into inviolability. It, mean, it meant at that time that a transformation of uh, a movement of frontier was possible, but without the use of force. And uh, today, it's true that uh, it's a big change. 
something. And it is the reason why I say you, I'm not sure that uh, I'm able to anticipate, to foresee what will happen tomorrow. I hope that uh, we'll have the courage to resist and uh, to uh, give a chance to peace. That is to say, to uh, create the condition of a new long lasting peace. But I don't know. I'm not sure of what I say for the future. But for the present time, uh, I'm quite sure of what I'm saying. There is a train. There are exceptions. There are always regression in the train uh, in Yugoslavia. It was not uh, uh, an action, but it was a partition. It was uh, 200,000 people died during uh, this, this horrible war. It was a kind of genocide. So. We had known such war in uh, in Europe. It was not your right. It was it was not uh, uh, an annexion uh, war. And uh, if uh, we let Russia go on with uh, this kind of uh, uh, of war, there will be another war in uh, in Taiwan. Yeah. And uh, a war in Taiwan, uh, we cannot imagine today the implications, the consequences of such a world, of such a, such a war. So I don't know uh, how will be uh, the future. We, can, we cannot imagine it. From the audience, I Ελάτε εδώ στο μικρόφωνο και θα κοιτάτε και την κάμερα. Thank you very much, first of all, for your lecture. I think it is uh, very informative for all of us here in the audience, first of all. And it made me just a little bit more optimistic, maybe. Not a total finger. But uh, not very optimistic, just to be fair. Um, I wanted to ask you about the aspect I think we didn't really, really mention. First of all, yes, we cannot, uh, we cannot disagree with facts that you presented. It's very obvious. But we didn't talk about the territorial aspect, because here in Athens, in Europe, in European Union, in, in, in Western world, we have a little bit different approach to how we perceive international relations and international stage, right? But we are living, my generation, all of us, we are really living through a very big change right now. And I don't know, in 10 years, in 15 years, in 20 years, I don't know what kind of power balance we will have in this world, but what we can see is that we still have actors that are non-democratic actors like Russia, like China, like some countries in, in Asia that do not follow what we see as a procedures. So when we say that there has been a decrease in war and casualties and all of this stuff, we, I really like the proverb that you use, the African proverb, yes, that it strikes us because you're born in Ukraine is in Europe, right? But for many other people, for Middle Eastern people, it has been going for decades and decades. So how can we talk about wars in any form, may it be in economic form, may it be in with this step back, as uh, Professor Professor said, in form of annexation against international law. But in any form, how we can say that it will be decreasing as we've seen when we still have for many people across the world, maybe not here in Europe, we have this really, really, really bad tendencies of the wars going on, on and on, and people living in bad and worse, even worse conditions. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you for your question and two aspects in my uh, answer. First of all, we all know that uh, accord according to the constructivist approach, our, uh, uh, our ideas are defined according to our identities. And uh, my identity as a French is not your identity. It's true that uh, with the problem you have uh, with Turkey and uh, in Samos and, uh, and so on, it's true that you feel more insecure that, than us uh, in France. So 
Well, it's from Ukraine. From, yeah, you are from Ukraine. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. No. So uh, it's obvious that uh, your identity defines your perception of the world. And it's not only the constructivist approach, it's also the realist approach, uh, classical realism with M Michael Boischer, uh, the role uh, of uh, uh, um, Robert Jervis, perception in misperception in international relations. We know that uh, our perception define the world in which we consider we are living in. So this is the first point. And it's obvious that my lecture is a lecture of a French professor and uh, uh, a Greek professor or an Indian professor will not have the same approach uh, than I. Uh, it's totally uh, clear. However, uh, what I observe is that in other countries, we're uh, quoting the situation in the Middle East uh, and so on, in, uh, in Africa, but even if there were 45, uh, 44, 44 uh, conflicts are go going on, so uh, there are numerous conflicts, but uh, you have less really less casualties in this conflict than in former conflict. Wars are less violent because, because the quality of armament, uh, no, really, with the quality of armament, you don't need to use an atomic bomb to destroy uh, an arsenal. You know that with the smart bombs, we all have the same effect. So you have less uh, civil ca casualties, and uh, globally, war are uh, less violent than in, in the past. It is what I observe. There are as many wars uh, as in the past, but when you look at uh, the one of uh, the, the curve I, I showed you, it's obvious that compared with uh, the, the 50s, war are quite... Uh, I won't, I won't say calm, but uh, uh, war are no longer the former wars with so many people, uh, battlefield related death and uh, civilian uh, civil casualties uh, beside, uh, beside the, the, uh, the fight. So this is my, my answer. I, I don't know if I'm able to convince you that uh, uh, I agree with the idea that it's a perception of French perception. And uh, from uh, Ukraine, you have obviously another per perception. But I think that uh, what I described, uh, the figures, the data I gave you, give us a, a clue, a, more than a clue. We know that uh, wars today are less, uh, uh, are less victims. Wars than before. Thank you. Would like to. I, I would be. <laughs> Thank you. It was a rather provocative lecture. Uh, in Greece, usually we're much more pessimist, and for good reason. We live uh, with a neighbor that, at least during the last year, twice uh, per week tell us that he'll throw us in the sea, that he'll visit Greece during the night with his troops. So uh, I, I, I mean, intellectually, I understand your argument. I cannot feel it. It doesn't help my sense of insecurity. And I don't speak as an academic. I speak as a citizen in this country. So of course, identity is a perception constructed by the real situation in which an individual lives. And I don't know how, this subjectivity can be overcome. And that's, I mean, can we all have an agreed uh, perception of reality or not? <laughs> if I cannot convince an academic, you, you used to read the same books than I read, who have the same references than I, I, I think that either you are schizophrenic and so, it's not my problem. The problem is a psychiatric uh, problem. Oh, otherwise, uh, I think that emotions are more important for dealing with political issues than reason. So uh, I think that uh, 
it was a joke, of course. Uh, obviously, emotion is more important than, uh, than reason when we deal with, uh, with the question of peace and war. It's obvious. And you're schizophrenic when you're a Greek person living in France for 20 years. <laughs> you're really schizophrenic yeah. because you don't know. You, either you are secure or optimistic, you don't know yeah. what, what to be anymore. <laughs> Are there any comments or any intervention? Please come here then. Uh, sir, I'd like to say that I agree with your point that from 1945 up until 2021, the world, the world has been largely at peace. That is a fact, all right? However, I disagree that with a few exceptions, of course, like the like the professional privilege mentioned, the Iraq war, the war between Argentina and the UK. That uh, since February of 2022, um, and the war in Ukraine, we have seen a number of other crises, like the crisis in the Taiwan Strait between China and the Republic of Taiwan, uh, numerous uh, civil wars <laughs> in Africa. So do you believe that there will be an escalation in these wars and will they influence the world? I'm, I'm not a, as an academic and a political scientist, I'm not a magician. I'm not able to foresee what will happen to, uh, tomorrow. My role is to give you the better explanation, the more rational explanation of uh, the present world. But after that, you have your own opinion. And I think that my role as a, an academic is to help you to, uh, to join the student and the citizen. I hope that what you are discovering here during the, your study helps you to grow up and to have a better understanding of the world, but of course, I, I and as I say uh, to my student, international relations theory do not aim at telling what is just, what is fair, what is good, and what is unjust, unfair, and and bad. No, the role of theory is to help you to have a better understanding of a complicated world. Uh, since you have so many information to deal with, I think that the role of theory is to simplify the world. The more complex, as Kenneth Waltz uh, used to say, the more complicated the world is, the simpler the theory must be. And so the role of an academic is not to tell you how to think. I have two daughters, it's enough for me. I'll have my hair and I'm not sure that uh, they'll uh, consider the inheritance of their father as uh, so important. So, but I have my heirs and my students, I'm not a guru. I'm not here to say how to think. I'm here to help you to have a better understanding and to, have, to be able to have your own opinion. Other comments? No? If it's not the case, then uh, we have to warmly thank uh, Professor Roche for his presentation, which, uh, as you, you realized, give us uh, a, a lot of, of uh, food for thought that I'm sure that you are going to, to discuss with your professors in the coming weeks during the seminars. Uh, it was very useful having you here and sharing uh, with us, I mean, your views, uh, and especially, I mean, views based on, uh, on, uh, on the data, as you said. And it's very important for the young generation to understand that, yes, this is a better world than it was in 45, let's say. And that I, I think you implied, uh, despite the fact that it was not the object of uh, your presentation, that multilateralism has something to do with uh, the, the stability in, in the world, at least, I mean, in the transatlantic world, in the US and Europe. In other regions, maybe we have uh, 
other sources of instability, but at least multilateralism is still working. Maybe, I mean, we have to, to think about transformation because, I mean, the facts on the ground maybe uh, give us uh, some, uh, some uh, problematic, let's say, outcomes regarding uh, how, how Europe and US will evolve in the coming years. Uh, but certainly, I mean, the, this solid argumentation, I think it's, it's very optimistic at the end. And thank you for this, uh, Professor. And I would like also to thank you, our colleague Gianluppi, for his, uh, her presence here today. And uh, let's promise that uh, the next lecture from uh, the Pantheon as will be your one. So, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>